How do you deal with conspiracy theories? Should humans go to asteroids before going to Mars? And can James Webb explore the Oort cloud? All this and more in this week's question show. Hey, everyone, welcome to the question show your questions, my answers. Now, as always, wherever you are, if you're across my channel, if a question pops into your brain, just write it down, I'll gather them up, and I'll answer them here. And I do the show live every Monday at 5pm Pacific time. So if you want to be part of the live show, it's a much longer show, it's about three times as long, and has a lot of questions and answers that you don't see during this edited shortened version. So definitely come and join us every Monday at five. All right, let's get into the questions. Roger Myers Jr. Hey, Fraser, love what you do. Been a long time fan. I have co workers who won't shut up about the so called Black Knight satellite, claiming it to be an estimated 13,000 year old ET satellite seen from the ISS. I tell them that if such a thing were real, it would be headline news. They disagree. Can you please debunk this conspiracy theory? No, no, I won't debunk this conspiracy theory. I, I tend not to put a lot of energy and effort into debunking conspiracy theories here on my channel, mostly because they don't interest me. Like it's, I just don't find it entertaining. I would much prefer to spend my time talking with people who care about space and astronomy, who believe these things are real, so that we can have an interesting conversation. Imagine like you're into sports, and you really like this team. And somebody keeps wanting to come up to you and talk about how I don't know that team doesn't exist, that that team is actually a bunch of alien robots. And every time you want to talk about how well they're playing hockey, they just want to talk about how they're alien robots. It's exhausting. It's not interesting. And it's not for me. And I don't think it should be for you either. And I guess my point is, is that we can choose the conversations that we want to get involved in. If someone asks you about what is this black Knight satellite, you've got a range of answers you can provide you can say, Oh, right. And if they push, you can just keep going. I don't know, because you, know, you don't know, you can say I don't care. And if they want to like really push you on this, well, then they're just being jerks. Um, or you can just say it's a conspiracy theory, and then leave it at that. But you do not need to engage. They might be trolls, which is obnoxious, right? Nobody likes trolls. I mean, I think trolls think they're hilarious. They themselves are hilarious. But nobody likes trolls, bullies, people bothering us. Life is short, spend your time in enjoying the activities and the intellectual pursuits that you find entertaining. And don't be dragged into conversations that you don't want to have, that you don't have to have. We get to have choose our conversations, the things that we watch, listen, think about. And so no, I, it's not a thing. You know, it's not a thing. I know it's not a thing. We don't need to talk about it anymore. Moving on. At this point, I'm sure you're wondering what was that weird code that showed up above my shoulder here. And that is a planet name coming from the Star Wars universe. And what that is, is a way for you to vote on what you think are the best most interesting questions that come up this week. And we do this every week. And last week, the winning question was in fables question asking, can you please estimate how many years until we're able to see the artificial illumination of an exoplanet in a photo. So congratulations in fables and congratulations to me for answering the question. We make a great team. So remember, please vote, give us a way to know which are the questions you like the best so that we can sort of fine tune as we make this show. All right, on to the next question. Ruling Moss 55. Do you think we should be doing crewed missions to near Earth asteroids to test exposure to interplanetary space before attempting to go straight to Mars? I think that it is important for us to do our space exploration step by step bit by bit, moving outward into the solar system. So the moon is obviously the first obvious place that we should go. Now that we've mastered low Earth orbit, let's go to the moon, the moon is relatively close, relatively easy to get to compared to Mars or an asteroid. It's within a few seconds of communication. So if there's some issue, we can talk the astronauts through a problem pretty quickly. It's just a few days away from sending help from sending additional supplies. So all of that makes sense. Once we've mastered 
living on the moon, and I should use that term mastered in the same way that once we've mastered being in low Earth orbit, then I think it makes sense to push on to whatever is the next closest place. And that's probably a near Earth asteroid. With a near Earth asteroid, you're looking at a longer communication delay time, you're looking at a longer time to get there if we need to rescue somebody or send them additional supplies, we will learn what the problems are, what are the issues and the dilemmas? How do we pull resources from an asteroid to survive? How do we hide under the regolith and so on? So I think there are a ton of challenges. And I think when it comes to space exploration, closer is better. Like I know Mars is exciting, but Mars is really far and being really far is really bad. There's just so many issues in terms of communication and in terms of being able to send help and additional supplies and all that, right? If the toilet breaks, they're looking at a year before they can get a new toilet. That's a problem. So I think that we definitely should be mastering asteroids. And I would spend quite a while learning how to live on asteroids, learning how to extract resources from the asteroids before I pushed on to Mars. I think that all of the lessons that we'll learn on the moon, all the lessons we'll learn on asteroids will then be able to apply to Mars. Like I know Mars is cool. And it is cool. I'm as excited about humans going to Mars as anybody. But I want us to do it in a way that is safe and sustainable in a way that we go to stay that we set up a research station and we live there and have a continuously inhabited research station on Mars in the way that we have people in Antarctica, not go set foot on the moon, not go back for 50 years. That sucks. Let's go to stay. And the only way we can do that is just for it to be step by step and sustainable. Tobias Carlson. Would it be difficult to put a satellite with a high definition camera in very low orbit around the moon? So you can, for example, see the landing gear of the lunar lander. There is a spacecraft in a relatively low orbit around the moon right now. It's called the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter. It's been there for almost a decade, more than a decade. It can capture images of the moon down to a resolution of less than a meter. It has absolutely seen all of the lunar landing sites. It can see the footsteps of the astronauts as they were walking across the moon. It can see the shadows of various objects that were left behind. You can see the rovers that they drove around on. So that spacecraft exists and has been doing incredible work and providing amazing images. You can go to the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter website. You can see thousands and thousands of images. It's mapped the whole moon down to an incredible resolution. So your wish is granted. That spacecraft already exists. Will. Do Patreon announcements at the start or the end, not the middle, ruins everything. As a content creator, as a person who runs a business, we always have this balance between how do we monetize what we do? I mean, like, obviously, from you guys watching this, the best case scenario would be there's no advertising and there's no Patreon and it's just everything is re released for free. And I would not be able to do this. So that would be suboptimal, right? Like if you want this content to exist, there's got to be a way that we pay for it. And the traditional way is to do that with advertising. The other traditional way is to put it behind a paywall. Like think about like your Netflix account or your Disney Plus account, right? Like you can't access any of the Netflix stuff unless you steal it. You can't access any of the Disney Plus unless you steal it right? You have to pay a monthly fee and then you get access to it. And I don't like putting things behind paywalls. It is like, and especially for educational content, it really feels to me like educational content should be freely available out there on the internet. And so the balance that I go with is some advertising, especially all the advertising on universe today, some ads here on YouTube, although I try to do the minimum amount of ads that I possibly can no ads in the middle, just the ad at the beginning. Um, and then Patreon and I don't do other sponsorship ads inside my videos. And I am able to make the whole thing sustainable. But without the patrons, we couldn't. So thank you, patrons. And of course, if you want to support the work that we do, definitely come and join our Patreon. go to patreon.com slash universe today. And for those of you who like don't like it, just skip it. Like we put the time codes in so you can just jump past all those annoying bits and just move on to that sweet, sweet space content. Reverend Keith Carter, are there any plans for James Webb to explore the Oort cloud for planet nine and beyond? JWST is the most powerful infrared observatory ever built. 
it's really good at observing an individual target. It's not great at surveying a vast area, which is what the Oort cloud is. I mean, the Oort cloud is this enormous cloud of comets surrounding the entire solar system. And they're incredibly faint. In fact, even JWST wouldn't be able to see any of the Oort cloud objects at their current distance, they are tens of 1000s of astronomical units away. But when objects start to fall inbound, when they start to come out of the Oort cloud and start to fall inward, and they become comets, JWST is one of the best instruments that's ever been built to help study them as far out as possible. So what will probably happen is these objects will be discovered by say the Vera Rubin Observatory. And then when an object has been confirmed, it seems to have a trajectory that's bringing it into the inner solar system, then time will be allocated to James Webb to do follow on observations to observe it and to try to map it and see what its size and orbit and tail and so on. So unfortunately, even with the best telescope, even the best telescope, we can pretty much imagine, we won't be able to see objects in the Oort cloud until they fall in. Now planet nine that you mentioned, actually isn't in the Oort cloud, it's probably in the Kuiper belt, which is sort of out beyond the orbit of Pluto. It's like, it's really hard, like the Kuiper belt is super close. And the Oort cloud is really far, the Kuiper belt is maybe a few hundred astronomical units away from the sun, you know, what one astronomical unit is the distance from the, the sun to the Earth. A few hundred of those is where the is where planet nine probably is while well, the Oort cloud is 10,000 to 50,000 astronomical units away, like it's really far. So we just don't have any way to be able to observe that. And once again, probably the way this is going to go is the Vera Rubin Observatory will find planet nine, and then follow an observations we made with James Webb. It'd be like, like trying to examine the sky with a straw, right? You don't want to do that. Like James Webb is the really powerful thing you do the follow on observations, other telescopes will find these things and they work together in partnerships. Edward Leonard, is there a theoretical dark antimatter? Well, part of the problem is that we don't know what dark matter is. But it seems that many particles have an anti particle version of them. Now, right now, we can create say, anti protons, I think like a certain isotope of helium is like the heaviest antimatter particle that's ever been formed. So it just depends on what dark matter is. And does it have some antiparticle version of itself? It's like a two part step first, figure out what dark matter is, try to be able to synthesize it in the lab, if we can do that, then see if we can actually create antiparticle versions of it. But it's a it's gonna be a long road. Yorick Salvador. Do you think that finding life or previous life on Mars may be tainted by the microbes the numerous rovers have brought with them? So the question I think you're asking is have all of the rovers and landers that we've sent to Mars that have some amount of Earth bacteria still on them? Has that been able to get out into the wild on Mars and pollute the regolith of Mars so that if we actually do go and try to examine search for life on Mars, all we'll keep finding is Earth life that got away. No, I don't think so. It's almost certain that there is viable Earth life sitting on the exterior of the spacecraft on Mars, that stuff is really hard to clean off. Even if you do your absolute best job to remove every bacteria from the outside of the spacecraft, some of it's going to get through a few crypto spores per centimeter. And as we've learned much to our horror, uh, there are a lot of Earth life forms that are perfectly viable on Mars that can survive on Mars cyanobacteria can handle the conditions on Mars, no problem. But these things want water, they want some kind of like brine would be fine, some kind of salty water that maybe they could find a little underneath the surface of Mars. But if the rover or spacecraft is just sitting there out on the surface of Mars, it's going to be very difficult for it to find a way that can actually multiply without any access to water, it's just going to be frozen, waiting for a chance to get warmed up so that it can go about its business. But it can't. So the things that we would have to really worry about is something that could actually go under the surface. If there was some kind of sample mission where they drilled down meters into the regolith and injected life down into some reservoir of water, you know, briny water underneath the surface of Mars, that Earth life could probably get going. 
but it's then limited to the size of that aquifer, however big that place is. That place could eventually become consumed by Earth life, but not the entire planet. So this is why NASA was very, very careful about spacecraft at say, Jupiter with the Galileo mission and they crash it into Jupiter. And because so it wouldn't crash into say Europa. And also with the Cassini mission, they crash it into Saturn so that it didn't necessarily crash onto Enceladus. Because in those situations, right, you get this spacecraft from Earth that is covered in bacteria, it goes under the ice somehow and gets into the under ice ocean on Europa or Enceladus, then it could spread across the entire interior of the moon. So that would be a problem. So no, I don't think so. The problem, you know, there, there's always the, the, the famous Viking experiment where scientists believed that they had found life in the regolith. And the problem with that is the lander was carrying life with it. It's almost impossible to remove it. And so as they exposed the Martian regolith to the conditions, water, warmth, chemicals, nutrients, things like that, Earth life would get cranking and produce a very similar signal. And that's one of the reasons why it's so difficult. So inconclusive to know whether or not there's actually life on Mars, because every time we detect life, we're probably just detecting Earth life that is hardier than we expected. Sib Sandbox, if we see distant stars and galaxies, how they were back in time, does that also mean we see them where they were located at that time? Do astronomical 3D star charts account for that difference? Well, when you talk about astronomical 3D charts, it doesn't really matter because the stars inside the Milky Way are gravitationally bound together inside the Milky Way. And so yes, they will have moved, but they won't have moved a lot in the amount of time it will take for the light to get to us. So for example, if you're looking at Alpha Centauri, and you're seeing it as it looked four and a half years ago, it might have moved a tiny little bit in the sky from where it is, but it doesn't really matter. But the bigger issue, I mean, obviously, you know, if you're looking at, say, some distant galaxy that is, you're seeing the light that left 8 billion years ago, that galaxy is not 8 billion light years away from you, it is many, many more, I don't know the exact number. But the point is, is that in the intervening time, not only has that galaxy been moving, but we've been moving, and the universe has been expanding. And so the location of that galaxy is very different from the location by billions of, of light years, which is, you know, a pretty large number. And the bottom line is, is that astronomers don't really care. They don't really think about it too much about like, I'm looking at this galaxy, and I'm learning about the chemicals that are present in this galaxy and what its evolution was, but I wonder if it's where it really is today, and what it really looks like today. It's not a question that they need to answer for the research that they're doing. They're just trying to understand that galaxy just by looking at the light that they can see. And so I think that that for a lot of people, when they get this idea that when we're looking out into space, we're looking backwards in time. It's like a paradox that you can't shake out of your head, right? It's like, we saw Betelgeuse dim and someone will well, actually you didn't see Betelgeuse dim it dimmed 500 years ago, and you're just seeing the light. Yeah, obviously. But the point is, we saw it dim. And let's measure the dim and what could be causing this dimming. And so it just doesn't really kind of, you know, when you say do astronomers count for it? Not really, because it doesn't really play into the kinds of observations that they're trying to make. In other cases, people are like trying to make an accurate 3d map of the Milky Way. And in some cases, they do have to account for the motions of stuff. And they also do really cool predictions like where will the stars be in the future? And where have they been in the past? And how quickly are they moving? And we know that one of the Gliese stars is going to come within 10,000 astronomical units of the Earth in about a million years. That's interesting. So they make those kinds of calculations when they're relevant to the observations that they're making. But mostly astronomers are interested in the nature of things and and their current location or the current movement or where they are in real time doesn't really play into that.
If you like my answers to your questions, as well as other things that we do at Universe Today, consider joining our Patreon club. You'll get an ad free experience on universetoday.com for life, even if you unsubscribe. You'll get ad free videos, early access to interviews, as well as other perks that are exclusive to our Patreon community. Thanks to everyone who has already subscribed and welcome to the recent newcomers Andrew, James Zimmerman, Clan Redhead, Stuart Christopher Brownlee, Donald Ferguson, Vlad Arafiv, J.R. Conlin, Joel Wittenberg, Stephen Eric, Glenn Pose. Join the club at patreon.com slash universe today. Glenn Foley, I understand that if you look in any direction, you're looking back in time, but do you have to look in a particular direction to look back to the Big Bang area? So the Big Bang happened everywhere. So you can look in any direction and see the Big Bang. When, you know, the, the misnomer, and it's right there in the name, Big Bang is that it was some kind of an explosion uh, in space, but it's not an explosion in space, it is an expansion of space. And so we always go back to this idea of imagine a 3d grid of the universe stretching on forever in all directions. And then over time, the size of the grid is getting bigger and bigger. And so if you're on any part of that grid, and you look across to any other part of that grid, it seems like things are getting farther away from you. And so the Big Bang is happening in every part of space in the universe at the same time. And the lessening of the density, the lowering of the density in the universe is continuing and continuing and continuing. It didn't happen in any one place. You could point to any spot in your room, the Big Bang happened right there. Shea 88. Does any of the propellant used around Earth stay up long enough to become part of the Kessler syndrome? No, no, like propellant is like the exhaust gas coming out of a rocket ship, it's going to be particles of water if it's like hydrogen and oxygen, it's going to be other kinds of particles is hydrazine and so on. So all of them, it's just particles and particles hit the atmosphere all the time. And in fact, the solar wind blows against any volatile gases and pushes it out of the solar system. And so you can imagine, like if there was a rocket and it was flying away and it was firing its rocket and leaving this trail behind, the wind would be the solar wind would be pushing this trail and blasting it away out into space like a comet's tail. And if the rocket was just firing for a long time, it would look like it had this kind of comet's tail behind it. Biggles Tintin. Surely there must be a more efficient fuel to send rockets to space. It seems that we've been using the same fuel for so long. It's surprising that we haven't discovered anything else. Coming up with a propulsion system that will allow you to get into space is sort of simple and it's complex. Like at its simplest point, the, the only way to get off of planet Earth and to get onto space and to move around in the universe is to throw things out of the back of your vehicle. And in the case of rocket, they're throwing exhaust gases, you could throw chairs, tables, whatever you want, and that would allow you to move your spacecraft around. You just need to have a lot of chairs and tables on board, not very efficient. And so the methods for getting spacecraft off of planet Earth are all about getting the most exhaust velocity that you possibly can, the faster you throw something out of the back of your spacecraft, the faster that you're going to go. And tried and true chemical rockets do the trick, they work. Now there have been other ideas for being able to fire things out with a faster exhaust velocity. The best example of this is say like a nuclear rocket, like if you had a nuclear rocket, you would be able to generate a lot of power, you'd be able to fire hydrogen gas out of the back of your rocket very fast, and you would be able to carry more payload, you'd be able to go faster to other planets in the solar system. But at the end of the day, there's just like no way around this. Like, yeah, it would be awesome if we had anti gravity, or metallic hydrogen, or um, antimatter. Um, you know, there are some innovative ideas where you don't have propellant where you fire things using kinetic energy. A good example is spin launch, where they've got this giant essentially slingshot where they spin this payload up to high speeds, and then they release it, you've got rockets that are launched from airplanes so that the airplane can share part of the propellant as it carries the rocket to higher and higher altitudes and gives it speed before the thing releases and flies off into space. In theory, you could launch things from balloons. So there have been a lot of good ideas, you know, orbital loops that would be going around planet Earth, uh, tethers that could come down and grab things, there are good ideas. But at the end of the day, the simplest idea is that you just launch a rocket 
and we'll probably be doing rocket launches for decades, if not hundreds of years from now rocket to work. Terence Kanzig Fraser, can you explain population three stars? Can JWST detect or has it detected them? Thanks. Population three stars, these are the primordial stars that formed first in the universe, they would have formed just a few hundred million years after the Big Bang. And they would have only had the hydrogen and helium and trace amounts of other elements that were formed after the Big Bang, they hadn't gone through any other cycles of other stars, no colliding neutron stars, no core collapse supernovae, no stellar winds blowing off of dying red giant stars, you would just have just the raw material. And it appears people believe that the rules are different for those first stars, they were probably able to get much more massive than the biggest stars that we have today. With the big stars that we have today, they get to a certain point and the winds that are blowing off of them are so powerful, the radiation is coming off is so powerful that no more material can fall onto them. And it limits their size to about say like 100 times the mass of the sun. But it's believed that these first population three stars could be much, much larger, like they could be 200 times the mass of the sun, maybe they could be a 1000 times the mass of the sun. I've seen simulations where they're 10s of 1000s of times the mass of the sun, the bigger they are, the quicker they die. And so these first stars would have formed quickly, and then they would have died within millions of years, and then more would have formed and more would have died. And eventually you'd get more and more of these heavier elements starting to build up that can form the population two stars and eventually the modern pop one stars like the sun. I don't know why the pop name is in reverse. It's weird. Anyway, so can James Webb see them? Well, directly? No, it needs to do a gravitational lens. So just the way Hubble was able to see some of these galaxies seen at like 500 million years after the Big Bang, it was able to do that using a gravitational lens where a giant galaxy cluster acts as a natural telescope lens for it to be able to see it. JWST will be able to do the same thing. Well, it's able to just see the kinds of galaxies that Hubble couldn't see, it can see those galaxies directly, it can't see those pop three stars. But with gravitational lensing, it should be theoretically possible for JWST to see those pop three stars, or at least the signature of those pop three stars, the deaths of those stars, some of the chemical elements mixed in with a galaxy where they're located inside behind a gravitational lens, Maybe, but there are also ideas to make even bigger telescopes that could see that directly, but they're probably not going to be built anytime soon. So until then, let's hope that JWST can pull this off. I, I think it can. Derek Dribble, if the universe is expanding at 70 kiloparsecs per second, then if you do the math, you should get to a point faster than light, right? Does the distance match the observable universe, which is like 43 billion light years? Yeah, there is a point where galaxies are expanding faster than the speed of light from our perspective. And it is not the galaxies that are all the way out to the edge of the observable universe, they're actually a lot closer. They're just a couple of billion light years from us is the farthest away where galaxies aren't starting to move faster than the speed of light. And so when you look at when you sort of imagine this entire observable universe, all of the places where light has left and is and is able to reach us only 6% of that entire observable universe is not moving faster than the speed of light away from us. And so that is the part of the universe that we could theoretically explore if we could build a spacecraft tomorrow and go the speed of light or almost the speed of light. The rest of it has already fallen over the cosmic horizon and moving faster than the speed of light away from us. Dico Rivanto. Fraser, would you fly on Dear Moon if they still plan to launch and land on Starship without any launch abort system? Congratulations to Tim Dodd for being one of the people selected to fly on the Dear Moon mission. At some point, our good friend, the everyday astronaut is going to climb aboard a SpaceX Starship, launch to the moon, fly around the moon and return to Earth. Would I do it? Not yet, I think. I mean, I know Tim is also quite nervous about this. And we've seen these things explode in the past. I'm sure they'll work out the technical challenges in the coming decades. But congratulations, to Tim. 
I wonder when it's going to fly. I sort of think about what are all the steps like on the one hand, it's a brand new rocket system and getting it to a point where it is able to carry human beings off of the earth into space around the moon back to earth, re enter the atmosphere and land safely. That feels like there's a lot of steps, a lot more testing that's required. But at the same time, NASA has chosen Starship to be the human landing system for the upcoming Artemis three mission, which in theory is going to land humans on the surface of the moon in 2025. And before that, we're going to be able to see a test. So probably in 2024. But that's landing on the moon which is going to be a lot easier than trying to get back through the Earth's atmosphere and land on Earth. So would I fly in dear moon? No, I didn't even apply like I I'm not I I would not want to be chosen to fly on this mission. I will wait my turn. I but I wish Tim all the best. Benjamin Dover, is it true that rockets cause global warming? Well, rockets are a combustion process. In some cases, they're burning kerosene. In other cases, they're going to be burning methane. And so both of those are carbon emitting processes. And so absolutely rockets will be contributing to global warming. But they're not the cause of global warming. They're just like any burning fire, they're going to be contributing and the amount of rockets that actually launch is fairly low. That said, there are some ideas on how you can make rockets greener because I mean, every part of our industry is going to have to be greener. So for example, with the space shuttle and with the space launch system, they also burn hydrogen and oxygen to release water as part of the process. Although water vapor in the atmosphere is not great. That's also a greenhouse gas. So you don't want that. Um, but ideally, what you want is some kind of carbon neutral process where you suck in carbon out of the atmosphere, use chemistry to turn it into methane, launch your rocket using that methane, rinse, repeat, and you maintain carbon neutrality the entire time, like using solar power to create your methane fuel. But the other issue is that rockets are sending particulates and vapor trails up into the high atmosphere and the effect on the climate is not entirely known. Although like obviously like effects on climate are never great. But again, we don't do a lot of rocket launches, you know, one or two a week across the entire planet. When you compare that to the 1000s and 1000s of aircraft that are launching every day, the millions and millions of cars that are driving every day, trucks, trains, boats, they're a drop in the bucket, but every bit helps. Deep Space Dave, as we get more technologically advanced, do you feel that it's ethically feasible to terraform Mars and transmit life there? So I mean, this just this question of is it ethical for us to modify other planets and asteroids and comets and star systems and all of that? I think it really just hinges on what is the indigenous life that already exists on these places. Like if there is life on Mars, bacterial life, maybe even like small multicellular life, nematodes, tardigrades, things like that, but they have been evolving on their own for four and a half billion years, we share a common ancestor, but that ancestor is right back at the beginning of the age of the planet. It's really, really valuable scientifically for us to understand the evolution of life, and we will want to understand it. And to be able to know that this life is changing and adapting in its own unique circumstances. And we have to be really, really careful. We have to really think this through about what kind of an impact we want to have on a place like Mars. Now I know by the way humans have behaved in the past that we won't that we will go there we will live there we will poop in the Mars brine, and we will pollute it with our own human bacteria. And that'll be that. And then you want to ask these questions about the life on Mars, and you'd be too bad because all there is is cyanobacteria everywhere you look like what do you know, more Earth life. And it'll be harder and harder to get those kinds of answers. So I think it's back to this issue of like, like, are you sad about manatees dying? Are you sad about about various life forms on Earth that we are pushing to the brink of extinction? If you are, then we should be really, really careful about what we're doing on other places where there is life where we are certain that there is life. 
But if we go to Mars and we look and we look and we look and we just explore every nook and cranny and we just don't find any life and we go to Europa and Enceladus, and we don't find any life, then these places are rocks and ice. And I don't think that we have any ethical issues in changing them how we want. I think they have aesthetic beauty. I think they are interesting wildernesses. Like if the mountains in your area didn't have any cool trees and animals and stuff that use them, would you be all right with someone just coming in and paving those mountains? No, they're nice mountains and they have a purpose in us appreciating the landscape around us. And there actually aren't a lot of places that are wildernesses like that. You've got some of the worlds like Mars and there's some other places around the solar system, but there's a lot like there are tons of usable comets and asteroids and places where you can grind up for your materials. So I think if there's life, we have to be super careful. If there isn't life, we have to decide what should remain as an untouched wilderness, even if there is no life on it. And then from there, we move on to exploiting the resources of the solar system without any real ethical issues at that point. It's just rocks and ice. And it could be that way across the entire Milky Way. All right, those are all the questions that we had today. Remember, vote for the question that you liked the best. It's really important to us that you do this. So please, please vote. Vote early, vote often. No, don't vote often, just vote once. All right. Um, remember, we do the show every Monday at 5 p.m. Pacific time. So come join us. Join the show. It's a lot of fun. All right, we'll see you next week. If you want to stay on top of all the important space news, join my weekly email newsletter. I send it out every Friday to more than 55,000 people. I write every word, there are no ads, and it's absolutely free. Subscribe at universetoday.com slash newsletter. You can also subscribe to the Universe Today podcast. There you can find an audio version of all of our news, interviews, and Q&As, as well as exclusive content. Subscribe at universetoday.com slash podcast, or search for Universe Today on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. A huge thanks to everyone who supports us on Patreon and helps us stay independent. Thanks to all the interplanetary researchers, the interstellar adventurers, and the galaxy wanderers. And a special thanks to Josh Schultz and Andrew M. Gross who support us at the master of the universe level. All your support means the universe to us.